So good morning and welcome to Real Life Church. I'm Pastor Bob and I'm glad you're watching today. We have a great message in store and you don't want to miss it. And neither do your friends and neither do your family members. So do me a favor, share it right now. I would appreciate that. Also, if you haven't subscribed to our podcast, you ought to. I have special guests with me each and every week and we talk about different things, different topics, and you don't want to miss them. And the best way not to miss them is to subscribe. You know, there are several professions that don't get the credit they deserve. And one of those professions are the men and women who serve as EMTs, emergency medical technicians. If you've ever had to call 911, these people show up, um, people you've never met, and they just go to work. What's amazing to me is they don't know what they're walking into. They don't know what the emergency is. They just walk in, start asking questions. They get different answers. They get good information. They get bad information. They take all of that. They figure it out and they just go to work. And one of the things that they never do is they don't try to assess guilt, try to find out what happened. They just take care of the person who is injured. They just go to work and save the day. We're in message number six of Snapshot. And the main idea in this series is Jesus did not come to continue something that had begun a long time ago. He didn't come just to complete the Bible. He came to introduce something completely brand new, to establish a relationship not between God and a nation, but God and all of mankind, to give us a new commandment. And we're going to talk about that here in a couple of weeks and a brand new movement called the church. Wherever he showed up now, he is drawing the crowd because he is disturbing the status quo. Most of the people that followed Jesus thought he was going to be the continuation of something old, perhaps, you know, a new rabbi with a new spin on the, on the law or the Torah. Maybe he'd come to reform the temple system or make some improvements, but he was actually coming to disrupt, not to continue to offer something completely new. Now I've asked in us this series for us to consider that. What would it be like for some young stud to come up here on our scene and try to replace everything that you grew up believing and practicing? It would be pretty difficult, wouldn't it? Pretty impossible, right? That young person would have a hard time gathering any type of traction. People would rebel against the new way and it would cause quite a scene. This was what was happening in the time of Jesus. And actually, when he does get arrested here in a few weeks, one of the charges that they're going to charge him with is inciting rebellion. Yep, Jesus, he was a rebel maker. Okay, a rebel causing um, disruptive, whatever you want to call him. That was Jesus. So one day, just like we talked about, okay, Jesus is walking with his disciples and they get hungry. You remember this from last week? It was the Sabbath and they're, him and his guys are walking and they pick off some grains, uh, heads of grain. You know, we, we talked about this last week and they were got in trouble for violating the Sabbath. And they got into that argument with the Pharisees. And finally, Jesus, uh, and, and the, finally Jesus has enough of the argument. And he basically says, you guys are so concerned about the law. I think we forget this. He would say me too because he was Jewish, right? You're so concerned about the temple. And he would say, well, I am too because uh, I'm, I'm Jewish. You're, you're so concerned about all these things that you fail to realize that there's something new right here in front of you. And then remember the statement that he made from a couple weeks ago, there's something greater than the temple and it's here. It was him. And if you're greater than the temple and the temple is no longer necessary, uh, well, then guess what? You're beginning to threaten those people who represented the temple. You're beginning to threaten um, their livelihood. You're beginning to threaten their importance. And if you don't need the temple, you didn't need the sacred people that guarded the temple and took care of the temple. And that's why these people are always at odds with Jesus. Jesus was letting them know the time of sacred things, and sacred places, and sacred texts. Well, it was being replaced okay, with sacred people, you and me. See, religion wasn't going to be about a temple, and it wasn't going to be about sacrifice, and it wasn't going to be about keeping Ten Commandments. 
Religion was going to be about you and a relationship with God. And Jesus spent his entire ministry, that three years walking on this planet, spending time with untouchable people and, and doing things that nobody else would do, like going to tax gatherers' homes and actually even asking one of them to be his disciple. And I'm going to tell you, when he did that, that really caused a lot of friction, not only within the people around Jesus, but even his closest friends, the other disciples. The other disciples didn't want Matthew to be a disciple because he was a tax collector. Peter didn't want to follow Jesus because Matthew was going to follow Jesus. Jesus was good about disturbing the peace, okay? Um, and it was threatening to some. And right now, we're right around Passover time. We're just a few days away from, well, the crucifixion. And Jerusalem is at an all-time high with people. People are there really for Passover, but they're also there because there's this guy named Jesus outside the walls, and people are following him, and people inside the walls are looking forward to seeing him. Everybody assumes, okay, that during Passover, that somebody, okay, would come and proclaim to be the Messiah. That had happened on many Passovers before. But now on this Passover, people are expecting, well, Jesus to enter into Jerusalem, take off his rabbi robe, and discover that he actually had a big capital M on his undershirt underneath that stood for Messiah, that he would proclaim himself king, and he would reestablish the nation of Israel, and they would throw out Rome, and things would be restored just like they used to be. But if you were listening to Jesus and you were listening to his teachings, you would have been a little bit discouraged because that's not what he was talking about. But he did speak as one who had authority, but he never, well, he, he just wouldn't take charge. And it says that he was winning over the crowd. And, and it was so, it's so hard for us to see this, but he's probably even becoming more popular. Are you ready for this? Than Passover. Think about that. More popular than Passover at that time. Well, so there was a Pharisee a man named Nicodemus. He was part of the Jewish ruling council, and that council was called the, the Sanhedrin. Um, the Sanhedrin would probably have been like the Supreme Court and Parliament all wrapped up into one. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was an elite group of people, anywhere from about 22 to 70 men, and they represented the religious system of Israel to Rome. John gives us enough detail. He calls him Nicodemus. And I, again, you can go back in history, fact check it. Was there a Pharisee named Nicodemus? And you'll find him. You'll find him right there in the history of the Jewish leaders. Now, John tells us some interesting stuff about Nicodemus. First of all, he says he comes to Jesus by night. And there's been a lot said about that. Was it because he was busy during the day? Maybe Nicodemus was busy. Maybe Jesus was busy. We already know Jesus was busy. Everywhere he went, crowds were around him. Maybe he went to Jesus because Nicodemus didn't want people to see him with this rebel rouser. Maybe. I don't know. I think it's all, you know, anyone's guess for that matter. Maybe Nicodemus was worried about his reputation, okay, of being seen. Uh, who knows? All we know is that Nicodemus is coming to see Jesus, and he came to him by night. Now, Nicodemus is on a mission, okay? Nicodemus probably has a bunch of questions that he wants to ask Jesus, okay? He is probably being sent by this group called the Sanhedrin to, to go scope out Jesus and find out what he's doing and find out what he's all about, even though they have been on those missions ever since Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, you know, a couple years ago now. So the scripture says, you know, that there was a guy named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, and he came to Jesus by night. Rabbi, which is an interesting term. This is a sign of respect. We know Okay, we know the Sanhedrin, the group of ruling people. We know that you have come from God as a teacher because no one can do the signs unless God is with them. 
Nicodemus doesn't really understand where Jesus is coming from, and, and that's okay because a lot of people didn't. And, and really, they're having a hard time trying to fit Jesus in a box. He, he, he doesn't act very Messiah-like, yet you cannot deny clearly that he isn't coming from God because of what he's been doing. And, and so keep this in mind. Um, Jesus just didn't heal people. Um, nor did he feed people or do arbitrary miracles. Every one of the miracles that Jesus did was actually a sign that was pointing in a specific direction. Now, in order to be a Pharisee, and especially to be a part of the Sanhedrin, you had to be pretty sharp. And Nicodemus was an educated man. Um, he understood um, that Jesus wasn't just some willy-nilly guy. Jesus is somebody but they just don't know who he is and what he's doing. And he does recognize that God must be with him in some way or another. Nicodemus comes to Jesus to ask his questions. Can you imagine the questions he's probably got? And before he even begins to ask his questions, Jesus, well, he does what Jesus does. He, he's, he begins to answer Nicodemus before Nicodemus even says, Here, here's my question. And, and, and Nicodemus, this is what Jesus says to Nicodemus. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, okay, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So no matter what Nicodemus had in mind that day of coming to ask Jesus these questions and getting these answers and going back and reporting, uh, Jesus gets right down to it. He says, let's, let's get down to the heart of the matter. You, you know that I've come from God, but I don't talk like any other person that you would consider very godly. And I do seem to have a different angle, um, Jesus would tell Nicodemus. So let's really get down to it. You cannot see God. That's what he tells Nicodemus. You cannot see God. And no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are what? You saw the term? Born again. That would have been absolutely, utterly confusing to Nicodemus, a, if you want to call it, religious leader, one of the 22 to 70 religious leaders that were supposed to be as close to God as anyone out there. But that's not the confusing part. Nicodemus is confused when he comes back and says, well, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother womb, can he? And what do you mean kingdom of God, by the way? This is Nicodemus kind of playing this out. I'm Jewish. And, and Jewish people um, in that first century um, believe they have a right to the kingdom of God just because they were Jewish, because a covenant that had been made. Well, we'll get to that covenant in a second. That covenant that was made between Abraham and God back all the way from Genesis chapter 12. What do you mean I can't see the kingdom of God? Of course I can. I was born into the kingdom of God. And that's what Nicodemus is probably thinking. And Jesus answered there in verse 5, uh, uh, if you're following along with me, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed, Jesus says to Nicodemus, he says, do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. What Jesus is really saying to him is you really have to be born from above. Um, he would say to Nicodemus, welcome to the kingdom of Israel. But to get into the kingdom of God, there's a second requirement. You have to be born again. And I think at this point, Nicodemus probably would have chuckled and he said, man, uh, this Jesus, he's playing with me, okay? I mean, how can be one be born again? Um, surely, he cannot, surely he cannot go into his mother's womb, can he? Now, certainly, is Jesus really talking about literally being born again? Is that what Jesus is saying? And probably this wasn't one of the questions that Nicodemus had for Jesus at this point. Now, I've got my list of questions, and this wasn't one of them. I've got people waiting at home for me um, to come back with the answers to their questions. And, 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 and Jesus says, no, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God unless you've been born again. 
And then he goes on in this conversation with Nicodemus, and he says, flesh gives birth to flesh. And, um, you know, I think Nicodemus probably understood that, that Jewish people have Jewish people, right? And Philistines have Philistine people, and Romans have Roman people, and Greeks have Greek people, and flesh gives birth to flesh, right? Your flesh got you into the kingdom of Israel, right, Nicodemus? Your flesh, because you are Jewish, got you into the kingdom of Israel. You are Jewish because you were born Jewish. Congratulations. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Nicodemus, spirit gives birth to spirit. Wow. Um, I'm going to tell you that Nicodemus is going to, you know, his head is probably spinning, maybe just like your head is spinning um, this morning as we're listening to this. And then he goes on and he tries to help him understand it in verse 8. And this doesn't help Nicodemus and it's probably not going to help you either. He says, but the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you know not where it comes from and where it's going. So everyone who is born of the Spirit. Okay, Jesus gives one of those, um, what do they call them, parables or illustrations or something that didn't make a whole lot of sense to, to Nicodemus. And maybe it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you, but let me see if I can help you to understand it. The word wind and the word spirit are actually the same word, okay? So the spirit is like the wind. And when you, when you know that there's a spirit, you see the effects of the spirit, but you don't know where it came from and you don't know where it's going. And so it is with the spirit of God. And this goes back to that covenant, okay? A, you know, Nicodemus is claiming an inheritance that was given to him that was a covenant that was made between God and Abraham, that God would make him, you know, a nation and he would bless the whole world because of that nation. Nicodemus would have understood that covenant, but Jesus is here saying that God is like a spirit and where he comes and where he goes and what he's going to do, well, he's not bound to that covenant. And that's exactly what he's saying, that he can go where he wants and do what he wants and reach new people that weren't a part of that original covenant. God does not live inside the temple because God is a spirit. God is a mobile God. And this is the new covenant that Jesus is bringing in as he ushers this brand new thing. The nation of Israel is going to be a means to an end. The entire world will be given an invitation to be a part of the kingdom of God. There will be people from every tribe, every nation, and every tongue. His invitation will be extended to everyone. And entrance into that kingdom requires a spiritual birth. A spiritual birth. Verse 9, Nicodemus looks at him and says, How can these things be? And Jesus looks at him and says, aren't you the teacher of Israel? Don't you understand these things, Nicodemus? And the conversation must have continued on. And I believe Nicodemus is really honestly somebody that wants to understand, but he's just not quite getting it. And then Jesus tries to bridge the gap with him, tries to give him something that he can actually latch onto. And, and there is one common thread that they can talk about that Nicodemus is going to understand, and of course, Jesus will understand. And he, he begins the conversation like this. He says, as Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness, Nicodemus would say, ah, I know that story, okay? I'm familiar with this, okay? I remember this. The nation was moving from Egypt um, through the promised land. They were going through an area where there were lots of snakes and people were getting snake bit. Some of those snakes were poisonous and people were sick and they were dying. And so Moses makes a bronze snake, um, like they needed another snake, but he makes a bronze snake, okay? And he puts it up on a pole. And they go through the area with Moses holding this bronze snake and the people are saved. Yeah, Nicodemus would have known that story, okay? Now look at what Jesus says, because he he doesn't stop there. He says, as Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. (laughs) Again, I've got these questions, Jesus, and you're not answering these questions. You're just confusing me, okay? And and, And you're making me rethink everything that I've ever been taught and 
And so Nicodemus, again, would have struggled with the phraseology, son of man, because that's a code word for, you ready this? You ready for this? Messiah. Son of man, that's, that's, that's the code word for the guy that we've been waiting for for a long time. And clearly you can't put the son of man on a pole because that would be a curse from God. Because when man hangs on a tree or when man is impaled on a pole or maybe a cross, that's the sign of a curse. And are you telling me Nicodemus would have been thinking that the Son of Man, that the Messiah is going to suffer? The Messiah is supposed to come and rule. The Messiah is supposed to come and take over. The Messiah is supposed to come and save. And you're telling me that the Son of Man, the Messiah, is going to suffer? To be cursed by God? Once again, Nicodemus would have said, I'm there to ask questions, Jesus, and you're not answering them. Now, we introduced this concept last week, and I, I, I want you to remind ourselves about this because this is important, especially when you're reading the Gospels, because we forget a lot of times that the Gospels are a retelling of something that happened a while ago that the Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when they're writing, they're writing about something that happened in the past, and then they will stop and they will interject their thought. You know, we do that all the time. We'll be telling a story, um, and then we'll say, and I can't believe that that happened. And we'll, we'll kind of interject our own thoughts into this. Well, the gospel writers do exactly the same thing. One of those great examples comes in the book of Luke chapter 9. I just want you to see it really quick because it really makes a lot of sense before we get to these next couple verses. He says in Luke 44 or 9 44, it says, let these words sink into your ears. The son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. That's Luke retelling the story right there. Yep. The son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. And then verse 45, he gives his commentary towards that, but they did not understand this statement and it was concealed from them that they would not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this statement. That's his commentary of what's going on. And there's a reason why I'm doing this, because Jesus and Nicodemus are having this conversation. And all of a sudden, John is going to jump in there in, in verse 16 and 17 and following. He's going to jump in there with, oh, by the way, this is really important information that I want you to get and I want you to understand. So John pulls out of the conversation with, between Nicodemus and John at that time, or Nicodemus and Jesus at that time, and he gives us 25 or 26 words, depending on what version you're reading, 25 or 26 words that actually have, they have, they have changed Christianity ever since. These words would reverberate around the world generation after generation. These 25 or 26 words would survive the empire. They would survive the temple and they go way beyond um, our generation. You know those words, right? They're some of the most popular words ever. For God so loved the world. This is John interjecting into this conversation because Jesus is talking about eternal life for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Words that would change Christianity. Words that would, that well, John would see, okay? After the resurrection, John would see that his friend came to fulfill. Now, Nicodemus doesn't understand these words right now, and John doesn't understand these words. Why? Because Jesus is still alive. He's still present with them. We see these words and we recognize that God so loved the cosmos. We get it, but they did not. So there's so much in this verse we could talk about. I mean, how important this verse is. But remember, I want you to remember this. John did not write these verses to be part of the Bible. We get that confused all the time. He was not writing the Bible. He was recording the events of Jesus' life. The Bible's not going to show up for some 400 years or more 
okay? And then they'll be joined from the Old Testament scriptures and then we'll have the Bible. What John is doing is he is recording Jesus's life. The things that he saw that would, well, he, it would blow our little itty bitty minds away. And what he is, is he's documenting the things that Jesus did and said, and now he's dictating it to a scribe. These verses, for God so loved the world. And when you see these verses in the original language, I want you to understand something. It's not written in Aramaic. It's not written in Hebrew. These words, these for God so loved the world is actually written in Greek. You know why? Because Greek was the language of the empire. It was the language of Palestine. It was the language that of the day of the people that needed it the most the message that was gonna go to the whole world. So he put it in a language that everyone could understand and everyone could think about, that God so loved the world. And then he goes on in verse 17, and this is, this is huge also. He says that God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. John says that, that God didn't send Jesus to line up all the sinners, okay, and tell them about their sin. He didn't come to the scene of an accident and lecture those who were injured. The church might have done that. We might have done that. Jesus didn't. Jesus said, I didn't come in to condemn the world. I came to save the world. I came to be just like the EMT. I came to save, to do my job and get to work. And when he realized, when he realized that the world needed a blood transfusion, well, he offered his own. So here we have it. Eventually, Nick will get the message. He will, okay? Because after Jesus was crucified, think about this, or in the process of Jesus being crucified, Nick is probably there. He's there because no doubt the whole entire Sanhedrin is there at his arrest. No, no doubt he's there at the trial. No doubt they're there watching this man be crucified. Um, and, and, and he's probably looking through the crowd. He's probably in the back with, with, with the rest of the religious leaders. And then, um, remember, this isn't going to end like everybody thought it was going to end. And all of a sudden, the pole, um, the tree, or the cross is raised up. And who hangs on that cross but Jesus? And it's just like Jesus said it would happen. Cursed by God, abandoned by his people, certainly not the end of the story the way we thought it was going to be. Nicodemus isn't done. You all know that he goes and he asks for the body of Christ, him and Joseph of Arimathea, and um, they, take him and bury him, even though Nicodemus really never got his questions answered on that day. What he was starting to figure out is where this man really came from. And today, if you're like Nicodemus, you may have lots of questions and you've come to God and God has not answered your questions. And then I want to invite you what John, the eyewitness to the entire of story of Jesus, what he suggested that we all do, that everyone in the whole world do. And it is the point of the gospel that you would accept what Nicodemus did and what Joseph of Arimathea did and millions and millions and millions of people have since then. Would you be willing to believe? The invitation is still open. The invitation that Jesus gave his disciples to come follow him. Would you be willing to do what Nicodemus did? Would you be willing to turn your life over to Christ? What John encouraged us to do? Would you believe him? Would you trust him? Would you receive Jesus as your savior? You realize because God loved, God gave. And that's what you do when you love people. Um, and God loves people. 
He created them to have a relationship with him. God loved, and so God gave. And what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to do exactly what that verse says. We're supposed to believe. We're supposed to trust. We're supposed to believe, and then when we believe, we receive. So it goes like this. God loved. God gave. We believe and we receive. God loved. God gave. It starts with God. We believe and we receive. That's the invitation that Jesus offers you. My prayer, you've done that. But if you're listening today and there's something going on in your heart saying, maybe you don't know all the answers to the questions. Maybe you're like Nicodemus. You've got a whole list of things that you want to ask Jesus. There will be a time and a place. I will tell you that. But no man sees the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Jesus gave Nicodemus the plan of salvation. It's the same plan of salvation that he offers you today. Man, if you've got questions about that or you have concerns about that or you want to talk with me about that, well, you know how to get a hold of me. You can, you can text me. You can call me if you're local. Matter of fact, if you're listening in some far off place like Oklahoma and you got questions and you're not sure about that, well, email me. Bob at reallifeyuma.com. And I'll sit down and I will talk with you because there is nothing more important than you receiving and accepting this invitation. It worked for Nicodemus and it'll work for you too. Father, thanks for this passage. Thank you again for our time together. Um, God, I pray that this message will go out um, and it will fall on the ears that it needs to fall on. And God, remind us again of your great love for us. And it is in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You don't want to miss next week. Next week, we're going to talk about the greatest leadership principle that you could ever know. All right? We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.